want to talk to you about a, a, something that we very rarely talk about or hear, although we've read over it many times. And the title of my message is The Friendship Initiative. But I want to read uh, in just a moment. David has just finished defeating the giant, the Philistine champion. And the Philistines, the enemy, the army, they're retreating. Now, I'm going to go to 1 Samuel, and I'm going to begin, actually, I think I had down 57. I'm going to just a couple of verses over ahead of that, and then get into the text. This is verse seven, chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I don't know. So the king said, inquire whose son this young man is. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now, when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home. That is, King Saul would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor even to his sword and his bow and his belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. Dr. Wilford Funk, co-founder of Funk and Wagnall's uh, Dictionary, was asked to list the 10 most expressive words in the English language. If you want to try, you can see if you get any of these. Uh, he's not the final authority, of course. <laughs> the most reverent word, mother. The most tragic word, death. The most beautiful word, love. The most cruel word, revenge. The most peaceful word, tranquil. Saddest word, forgotten, the coldest word, no. The most comforting word, faith. The most bitter word, alone. The warmest word, friendship. Good friends are like stars. You don't always see them, but you know they're always there. Isn't that great? I heard this story. It's an old story, so it's probably not a new story to you. But preachers have a way of repeating things over and over, you know. Three guys are washed up on shore of a desert island, and they've developed a great friendship. Can't you see the desert islands in the cartoons? I mean, they're only like this big around with a palm tree. So they develop a great friendship, thankfully. But it got pretty boring. And it got kind of grim. Not much to do, and one day... A bottle washes ashore. You know about that bottle. One of the men begins to fumble with the bottle, and out comes a genie. Hi, I'm a genie. I'm releasing, for releasing me from the bottle, I grant to each of you one wish. Okay. First guy says, I've always wanted to go to Paris. I wanted to see the Eiffel Tower. I wanted to see the Arch of Triumph. I want to see those sidewalk cafes, and, and maybe a, a, there's some romance there, and so that's where I want to go. He's gone. Second guy says, my family live in Isla Mirada, Florida. I'm anxious to see them and do a little bit of fishing with Ed. So I've heard of that Ed guy down there, and so uh, and Mark, and several others, and so I'd like to go to Isla Mirada. He's gone. The third guy says, you know, he's all alone. His friends have all disappeared, and it's kind of desolate and quiet. And he says, boy, it sure is lonely. Wish my friends were back. <laughs> now, that might strain the relationship a little bit. I think it might. 
But friends will work it out, right? They'll work it out. If you had only one earthly wish, not including material goods and money, what would it be? I think the wisest choice would be friends, real friends. Uh, The words of a psychology professor, if you go through life and you have one lifelong friend, you will be very, very fortunate. I didn't plan that. I have two of my best friends sitting back there from Indiana, but I didn't plan that this way. Uh, to, uh, and they brought Michaela along. Maybe she'll be my friend too, their granddaughter. But they did attend my church in Indiana. The Stanford Research Institute did a very interesting survey, and they investigated to see what makes people successful or unsuccessful in the workforce. And here's what they found, although polls are not always accurate. 85% of our success on the job was our ability to relate well to people. And only 15% of success had anything to do with skill or knowledge. Now, as we think about friendship and building relationships, it has been suggested that historically in America, there are two public figures that stand out or excel as examples of friendship. Surely there are more, but there are two. One is Benjamin Franklin. When he was young, I, I wasn't, you know, I never met Ben, but he was supposedly, he was obnoxious. And an old Quaker friend one day pulled him aside and he said, I need to talk to you, Ben. I want you to know that you're offensive and you offend people. And the best way I can describe your relationship with people is your best friends would rather be without you. Now, Benjamin Franklin changed, and by the time he was in Paris, as one of our ambassadors, he was the most sought-after man in the world for friendship and wisdom. The other guy is Abraham Lincoln, poor boy, country boy, low self-esteem. In 1870 or 1837, he wrote to Mary Owens and he asked her to marry him, at which point he continued with his request for, uh, for her to marry him by saying, if I were you, I would not marry me. It would be a mistake. <laughs> and she didn't. <laughs> Some of you, most of you know that. After which he wrote to a friend and he said, I think I will never ask anyone else to marry me. He said, I'm such a blockhead, no one would ever want to live with me. starting to sound a little about Charlie Brown, isn't he? Such a blockhead. Now, there are people that feel that way about themselves, sadly, unfortunately. Lincoln, the man that that led his his nation, a crippled nation, through civil war and started the process of reconciliation, a president that proved to be a friend to the nation, A woman was seen at the War Department attempting to secure a pass to show her husband their brand new firstborn baby. And that was strictly against the rules. Lincoln did not rest until he made that happen, assigning the mother and the child to a room in a hospital in D.C. These two men learned friendship, relationship building. That's very important. Now, let's talk about this amazing friendship, David and Jonathan. There is in this story a tremendous environment for friendship. In 18.1, it said, and I read it, Now when he, David, had finished talking with Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Jonathan, of course, is Saul, King Saul's son. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Jonathan was a lot like David. Jonathan was at least five years older. Uh, both of them were very bold, both of them had a deep trust in God, both were men of action. However, there were some major differences, as you might know. Uh, Jonathan is the firstborn of a king. David is the lastborn of a farmer. Jonathan was a crown prince, and everyone expected him to be the next king. So three things have to happen to have a healthy environment for friendship. First of all, I think there has to be respect. Among true friends, there will be respect. David shows up uh, from nowhere. He is virtually unknown. He challenges the Hulk or the Rock or Goliath, whatever you want to call him, with a little stone. And the Bible says that, that the giant was six feet, nine inches tall. Masoretic text, text tells us that the guy was nine feet, seven inches tall. Whichever is true, the average Jew in that day uh, was about five feet three. So no matter what size he was, he still looked like a giant, if any of those, uh, uh, are, any of those statistics are accurate. He not only earned the respect of Jonathan, but of Saul and every single soldier on the hillside, of course. And that certainly was one of the ways that he earned Jonathan's respect. 
The second thing I'd like to mention, we must have good self-esteem. If you read in verse 1, Jonathan loved David as himself. Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And then we see it again in verse 3. Now remember, the commands of Jesus, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Any of you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself? That's not only, that not only suggests that we love self, it's also saying perhaps that you will never be able to truly love other people until you truly love and respect yourself. Jonathan was a true warrior among brave men. Jonathan was one of the bravest. He was a perfect soldier, whether he was a fighter or a general. He was chivalrous. He was generous. He was utterly free of jealousy. He was a fervent believer in the God of Israel, and he was a patriot. Jonathan's example may very well have influenced some of those noble utterances that we see in the Psalms over and over again, the Psalm of David. What really influenced Jonathan to love and to respect David was a lot more, I say, than the defeat of the giant. David's childhood faith in God. His belief that Jehovah would, could be trusted and that nothing is impossible with God. All things are possible with God. So there was respect, and there was a, self, a healthy self-image in both David and Jonathan. Now, number three, there was initiative. Jonathan took the initiative. You'll, have, you'll notice that all the way through. It was almost as if David had very little to offer except that he'd killed the giant. In, in 18.1, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Jonathan's made, he's taking the initiative. Jonathan and David made a covenant. Jonathan, again, is taking the initiative because he loves him as his own soul. And in verse 4, Jonathan took off his robe that was on him, gave it to David with his armor, even to, the, to his sword and his bow and his belt. If Jonathan had not taken the initiative, there would have not developed a friendship. How often do, we, do, do people sometimes cross their arms and they sit back and they say, nobody's friendly in this church. And nobody's friendly in our neighborhood or wherever. So we, un we need to uncross our arms and extend our hand or our elbow. I guess we have to do that sometimes these days and take the initiative. When David and Jonathan met, the elements were in place to create a good environment for friendship. Okay, There was respect. Uh, both of them had a good self-esteem and there was a, there was a willingness to take the initiative. The second thing I want to look at is the way Jonathan expressed his friendship. There's no question that the chemistry was right, but it takes a little bit more than that to maintain a friendship. It takes commitment. How did Jonathan express his friendship? Well, he realized that friendship is more than just words. You know, we we hear a lot of words, but it's more than words. He's, John said, I, I want you to be my friend by giving him a gift. Now, we'll look at that in a minute, but, but friendship can, cannot survive on just gifts and, and chemistry. Friendship requires commitment. It requires a covenant. A few years ago, you know, let me say this. I, I, there's never any suggestion that they, they really made a covenant or that we make a covenant, but we, we kind of do that. It's just a matter of that's what happens when we make a connection and, and we have a real friend. I'm here for you no matter what. Anyway, a few years ago, I shared a message on friendship here. It wasn't this message. It was a different one. Uh, some of you might remember that in the message I suggested that friendship might include financial arrangement. Like, uh, I, was, I think I said that if I have friends that if I ask for, let's say, $15,000, they'd give it to me. And I have those, those same kind of friends, I would do the same thing for them. i just do it. Following that service, I was approached by a friend in the congregation, a rather tall fellow who isn't here this morning. And he was showing... <laughs> He was showing some concern and inquiring about possibly reassessing our relationship. Uh, <laughs> I think he wanted to maybe be buddies and, or maybe co-workers in the kingdom, but friendship, maybe $15,000? He wanted to, he wanted to re re uh, reassign that. So uh, that was a bit of a, I, I thought that was interesting. Probably 
Uh, <laughs> you, you only had money to real friends, that's for sure, right? The concept of friendship needs to be rescued from, I would say, an all-too-casual use. You know, in the Hebrew language, the future is behind you, okay? Maybe you don't know that. It's not in front. We always think about we're going into the future, no? In the Hebrew language, it's behind you. Instead of striding confidently into the future, they talk about stumbling backward into the future because we can see the past, but we cannot see the future. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. We can never tell what happens next. What now? That's kind of my, one of my favorite words, what now? But what a blessing to put my hand in God's because he can see the future, even if I am backing into it and I don't really know what's going to happen. And to have truly committed friends to walk beside me, that's, that's life at its best. But I have to be a good friend as well. Another expression is you are important, okay? Jonathan not only said it, he showed it. In verse 4, he gave David gifts, a robe of a crown prince, the robe of royalty, a robe that represented the kingdom, a robe that represented status. And when he put the robe on David, he's saying, you're really important. You're important to me. And if you look at chapter 17, beginning about verse 55, nobody knew David until he met Goliath. Nobody knew David. Jonathan says, at any rate, you're important. And friendship says, you're important. There's a poem uh, written by Robert Frost, who is a a guy that I I really like. And uh, this little poem reminds us that a friend is someone we want to be with. He says, I'm going out to clean the pasture spring. I'll only stop to rake the leaves away and wait to watch the water clear. I may. I shan't be gone long. You come too. I'm going out to fetch the little calf that's standing by the mother. It's so young, it totters when she licks it with her tongue. I shan't go long. You come too. Wow. It's it's just really saying uh, we like to do things with a friend. That makes it more exciting. That makes it more fun. A third expression of love, by his actions, Jonathan says, I give up everything for you. In John 15, 13, it says, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Maybe Jonathan did as much. He didn't lay down his life, but he did let David have what was rightfully his, the kingdom, the throne. And I think they both understood that it was God's will. You don't just give up the throne to some guy who comes along and kills a giant. But I think they both were so connected with God. Jonathan says, friend, I will give up my rights and I will defer to you because we both see that this is God's plan. Expression of love. The fourth expression, Jonathan said, I believe in you. You look at verse 4. Jonathan gave his robe to David. And then it goes on to say, With his armor, he gave David his armor. I believe in you. That's not the first time he was given armor. It was the second time he was given. First time Saul gave him armor, warned him don't go out, and did not believe in him at all. He hoped, but he didn't believe in him. Jonathan, on the other hand, did believe in him. He rejected Saul's armor, David did, but it has been said that he wore Jonathan's armor the rest of his life. Do you have anyone that believes in you? I, uh, I pull out letters and cards from people, parishioners, family members. I don't, uh, actually I intended to bring one that I don't think I brought, but that's all right. Um, I had one that someone, it didn't actually, it wasn't a card, it was a prayer for me, but it was so amazing. And I sometimes, not always looking for encouragement, but I sometimes... Uh, pull out things that I'm going through the file, and there it is. It's a letter from someone from one of my churches or some even here, and just an encouraging letter. Isn't it nice to get that, uh, to pull out a letter? Wonderful, great affirmation. Someone believes in you. Someone believes in me. I think how great the disciples must have felt when Jesus affirmed them in John 15, where it says, I no longer call you servant. Instead, I have called you friends. 
For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I I chose you. Do you believe in someone? Tell them. Send them a letter. Use the phone. People who believe in me make a difference in my life. My wife, my friends, my pastors. Most of my pastors that were my mentors are all dead, but I still have the memories of of them encouraging me. Let someone know that you believe in them and you're giving them armor. Jonathan said, I am willing to be vulnerable. I'm at your disposal. And then in verse 4, we're still in verse 4, Jonathan gave him his robe, his armor, and his sword. It meant I'm giving up or lowering my defenses. The sword was a defensive weapon. He defended with it. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to uh, clench my fist. I'm not going to cross my arms. I'm not going to make 25 excuses. I'm going to lower my defenses, and I'm going to make a new friend, and I will be vulnerable because a friendship is a vulnerable thing, especially if you remember when you were children and your best friend decided to go off and be somebody else's best friend. You know, Those things happen. I'll be vulnerable. I'm taking a risk, but I'll try. Jonathan also gave him his bow, an offensive weapon used to keep people at a distance. We can do that. Keep everyone at a distance. Then you won't get rejected and you won't get hurt and you won't have friends. Jonathan says, I will not keep you at a distance. Finally, he gave David his belt. And to- that's, that's total trust. The belt held all the weapons. I'm vulnerable completely. Pastor Kenneth Chafin said, in a way, the gift anticipates the time when Jonathan will give up his right to the throne to his friend. Remember these words by Paul Simon? A winter's day in a dark and deep December, and I'm alone and gazing from my window to the streets below on a fresh and fallen silent shroud of snow. I'm a rock. I'm an island. I build walls of fortress deep and mighty that no one can penetrate. I have no need for friendship because friendship causes pain. It's laughter and it's loving I disdain. I'm a rock. I'm an island. So don't talk to me of love. I've I've heard the words before. It's sleeping in my memory and I won't disturb the slumber of my feelings that have died. If I had never loved, I would have never cried. I'm a rock. I'm an island. I have my books. My poetry protect me. I'm shielded in my armor, hiding in my room within my womb. I touch no one, and no one touches me because I'm a rock. I'm an island. The rock feels no pain, and the island, it never cries. And I might add to that, a man without friends and without love never really lives. Let me close with uh, one more poem, okay? This is called To a Friend. You entered my life in a casual way, and I saw at a glance what I needed. There were others who passed me or met me each day, but never a one of them heeded. Perhaps you were thinking of other folks more, or chance simply seemed to decree it. I know there were many such chances before, but the others, well, they just didn't see it. You said just the thing that I wished you would say, and you made me believe that you meant it. I held up my head in the old gallant way and resolved you should never repent it. There are times when encouragement means such a lot and a word is enough to convey it, but there were others who could have as easy as not, but just the same, they didn't say it. There may have been someone who could have done more to help me along, though I doubt it, but I needed, what I needed was cheering and always before they had led me plod onward without it. You helped to refashion the dream of my heart and made me turn eagerly to it. There were others who might have. I questioned that part. But after all, they just didn't do it. Respect and a good self-image. Someone has to take the initiative. And that's all, that's all part of God's plan, by the way. This is not just words. Love more than words. You're important. Sacrificing for a friend. I believe in you, and I am willing to be vulnerable. Thank you, Father, that you are a friend when perhaps sometimes we feel like we have 
not another friend in the world. Well, you're not a friend with skin on, with flesh on, as they say, but you're the greatest friend that we could possibly have. If there's anyone here this morning that has never really accepted you as a friend and as Lord, I pray that that would happen even as we pray. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for those who have gathered here today. Be with our nation. We love you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stand with me, please. May you be blessed with good friends. May you learn to be a good friend to yourself and to others. May you be able to journey to that place in your soul where there is love and warmth and feeling and forgiveness, knowing you have a friend that is closer than a brother, and his name is Jesus. Amen.